Well, hello there, and welcome to the podcast where our goal is to remind you that amidst the chaos and craziness of the world today, there are still plenty of good things that are worth shouting about. In each episode of this podcast, we're going to be joined by nonprofit professionals, leaders, experts, and advocates to hear their stories, facilitate conversation and connection within the nonprofit sector, and hopefully put a smile on your face. We like that. I'm Matt Barnes. This is Nonprofit Connect. Let's share some good. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when you're listening to this, because you can listen to it anytime you want to. Welcome to Nonprofit Connect with Matt Barnes. I'm Matt Barnes, or at Matt from Rogue, if you're looking for me online, pretty much everywhere, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, X, whatever. Anyway, it's just me today. Tiffany's out, and so I'm doing this intro solo. For those of you joining us, maybe for the first time ever, Nonprofit Connect is a resource that we are providing for nonprofit organizations to connect with each other, to learn from each other, to grow. We find that the nonprofit community, they don't do that very much. And you guys, y'all get so busy with all the stuff you got going on and focused on everything you got to do that sometimes you don't have the time to actually hear from other people in the industry who are doing amazing things. Before we get into our interview for today, which is epic, I wanted to mention we just did, so we do a live event in person, Nonprofit Connect event every month here at Rogue Collective in Newport Beach, California, which you're welcome to join us for. You can go to npconnect.roguecreatives.com to check out more on that. But we were doing this event last month and we screened the documentary Uncharitable. And if you are not familiar with this documentary, it just came out end of last year and it is fantastic. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It will challenge the way that you see your role, your job, the way that you see fundraising, the way that you see nonprofits, and hopefully will inspire people to lead the charge towards some much needed reform in the way that nonprofits are treated and handled and allow nonprofits to do what you guys do so well, which is solve the problems of the world. And that's really what needs to happen. So check out Uncharitable if you haven't. There's also the book that it's based on by Dan Pilata. You can check that out as well. His TED Talks are fantastic as well. But man, the movie was really good, really challenging. Jake Gyllenhaal's dad directed it and Edward Norton's in it. And it's really interesting and really cool. So check that out. Today, though, on the show, we have an investor in property tech who runs an angel group and a nonprofit foundation in the prop tech space, which is something I know nothing about, right? So this is a very different kind of interview for us. It's a different approach to a nonprofit, I think. Anyway, he's very keen to help startups in the world of prop tech through investment and advice. His name is Matt Knight, and he's awesome. And so check out this interview. I think you'll find it interesting. And yeah, we'll be back with Matt Knight right after this. Nonprofit Connect with Matt Barnes is brought to you by Rogue Creatives. Did you know that your brand has a personality all of its own? Well, it does. Or it should. But maybe it doesn't. How do you know if it does? Here's what you do. Ask yourself, does the way you describe your organization match the way you describe your branding? Because it really needs to. Why? Because people don't connect with organizations, they just don't. They don't feel connected to them. They, they feel connected to characters. They feel connected to personality. So it's super important that your brand has a personality that connects with the right people to bring them into your story. And that's what Rogue Creatives is all about. We've developed our very own process called the Strategic Storytelling Framework to define your brand personality and create a brand foundation that will make sure your organization has that main character energy that connects with others and pulls them right into your story. And by the way, it works. And we got the receipts. Our nonprofit clients have seen incredible increases in giving that have allowed them to help even more people and make the world a better place. Get started today by visiting roguecreatives.com slash NPC. That's NPC for Nonprofit Connect. You can schedule a free brand consultation and take our free online brand character quiz. And we all know that everybody loves a good online quiz, especially when it's free. So get over there and do that because it's it, why not? Why wouldn't you? You love it. It's going to be fun. That's roguecreatives.com slash NPC to begin defining your brand character today. There's no commitment or risk for you at all. And honestly, we just can't wait to meet you. We, we kind of think we could be good friends. I think we could hang out. You could buy us lunch. We can help you with your branding and 
talk about the shows we're binging or whatever. It'd be nice. Rogue Creatives. Seriously. Creative storytelling. All right. On with the show. Well, I am here with Matt Knight. Matt, thanks so much for being here on the show. Happy to do it, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We always start with a segment we call Three Random Questions. I have a list of about 90 random questions, and we have a randomizer that chooses three. So, cool. double random. Let's see what we got here. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Flying would be a lot of fun. There you go. <laughs> okay. How late can you sleep in these days? 7 a.m. My kid, Ramey, I cannot sleep in late at all. How many kids do you have? Two boys. Two boys? And they're eight, so they wake me up. Oh, yeah. They're not going to let you sleep. No way. Even on a day off now, like if I go away, usually my body just won't let me sleep at like maybe eight if I can, but usually not even that. I got blackout curtains and a noise machine, right? And it's quiet. Maybe I'll make it to eight, but that's a maybe. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Last question. This is a long standing philosophical question in society. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Too many. I'm not patient. Right, I just got to bite it. <laughs> All right. Thanks for indulging me in those questions. Let's jump in. What's your origin story, Matt? How did you get to where you are and what are you doing? I come from real estate, private equity. I worked at a big PE shop in the last recession called Colony Capital. And I managed a few hundred million for them and the GSC when all the banks went belly up. And they gave me a portfolio of 150 problems and said, go figure it out. And so that was fun. It was awesome. I loved it. Even having to foreclose on some people, it was a good thing to learn. And then left in 2013 with a high net worth guy buying real estate in the Sun Belt, like Virginia to Arizona, and quickly saw tech was a lever we could pull that nobody wanted to pull in 2013. There was no real estate tech to speak of, really. There was a little bit, but not much. And so I got into real estate tech, which we call prop tech. Ended up starting a fund with a partner, which was fun. Built an incubator with WeWork, which was fascinating. Built an accelerator with a few other groups. And then left in 2019 and accidentally started the largest angel group in the world in real estate tech, which I still run to this day. And spent a couple of years helping build a prop tech fund under a generalist VC funds umbrella which I ended up leaving and joining a nonprofit, which does real estate tech. So I run that nonprofit with the other directors and I run the angel group until somebody makes me grow up. That's my job. <laughs> awesome. So it seems like the nonprofit was a little bit of a curveball there at the end of this journey. How did that come about? It was started by a venture fund in PropTech, the second largest PropTech fund in the world. And so it's really the same people I've always been working with and my friends, same contacts, but giving non-dilutive capital and being able to do things that VCs and CVCs can't or shouldn't do, it's been fun. So I still get to work in all prop tech. It's all I do all day, every day. But it's just a different angle on focusing on ecosystem and different things that we can do that wouldn't fit within the seven to 10 year time horizon of a fund. Interesting. So how does that work from a nonprofit standpoint? Do you operate the same as most nonprofits as far as like raising the funds and having to do the galas and all that kind of stuff? Or is it a very different approach? No galas yet. We were seeded by Second Century Ventures, which is a very large evergreen venture fund and prop tech. And since they were seeded by the NAR, which I believe is the largest trade association on the planet, they are very well resourced. And so we are well capitalized for a while. But yes, we are planning on fundraising in the future and building our products with an eye towards at least partially being exciting to donors. And there's sort of a Venn diagram, like there's problems that need to be solved and there's problems that donors will get excited about and give money to and where they overlap is our sweet spot. But there's some that may or may not make sense for specific donors that we think need to be done either way. So that's sort of the balance that I have to walk that line of this needs to be done. And I can give you examples if you want. This needs to be done, but I'm not sure there's a donor profile that will fall over themselves writing me checks for this. Right. I think that's a common theme amongst all the nonprofits I've worked with and talked to on the podcast is that there's certain aspects of your work that you get the donors excited about. And then there's other things that you still need to do that are important that it's a little harder to get people excited about. And we've been talking a lot about changing the sort of approach from 
project-based or directed giving to undirected giving and unrestricted giving so that nonprofits can have the expertise to and freedom to go out and use their expertise and do the things they need to do without having to kind of say, all right, your money's going to go straight to this thing and your money's going to go straight to that thing, but nobody wants to fund this thing. How do you see that? Is that a challenge that you've thought through at all or for the time when you do get to going to donors? Or is that something that you really haven't thought about yet? For sure. I've been digging into it a lot. And the analogy I use is sort of like your alma mater. You can give money back to your school and say, this is for general things at the University of Tennessee, or this is for the women's basketball team at the University of Tennessee. You can be broad or you can be specific. And I think some of that comes with trust is that we have to earn our donors trust that we are efficient and we are transparent and we have their best interest and the ecosystem best interest in mind. And then some of it is results. Just let me show you what we've done. And so it's, I think we're trying to balance that product catalog and quantifiability of outcomes with still doing things, even if we don't have the perfect metrics to display success. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. I think you may have a bit of a leg up on it because of your background and the proof of what you've done in the for-profit sector. People maybe have that trust there. And I think that's something that a lot of people in nonprofits have. They start what they start because of their journey has usually brought them there, but they don't maybe leverage it enough to show that their expertise in this area has earns them some relational capital or with, with people to kind of do the things that they need to do and have some freedom there. Yeah, I'll tell you in the investment game, there is very little benefit of the doubt. It's show me performance and communicate with me about the risks and then I'll make my own decision. I think that's the case with some of the best 501c3s that I've seen as well. Yeah. So this is an area I know nothing about, prop tech, any of that kind of stuff. What is it specifically that you guys are doing and what does that look like? And how does doing that through a nonprofit differ from doing that through a for-profit? One of our taglines is sort of catalyze people and ideas that innovate in the built environment. And that can be, I mean, you're sitting in a building right now. You're using the lighting system that is powered by your building right now. You're breathing the air from the air filtration system in a building right now. Like building technology is a massive, massive space. And so our challenge has been, how do we narrow down on problems that we should solve? And so to give you a definition, in my mind, real estate tech and prop tech is technology that you sell to building owners and managers and developers, right? It's people that own, manage, control these buildings that we're sitting in and working in and living in and shopping in, right? And so what I've spent a decade on is what is that tech? What's exciting? What do they care about? And what the foundation does is we say, how do we support that ecosystem? And so one of the things we've paid for is mental health for innovators because it's lonely and it can be depressing and all the weight is on your shoulders if you're running a startup or you're running an innovation team at a large global developer, right? That's very hard to do. VCs aren't paying for that, so we paid for it because they're specialists in mental health for tech founders. And so we did that. Another thing was there is a ton of technology sitting in labs in academia. And so we started a partnership with MIT and we're going to be working on other big engineering schools where we can say, what's sitting in your energy lab? What's sitting in your 3D printing lab? What's sitting in your self-assembly lab? And how do we bring that into the built environment? And so it's things like that where we say, how do we get people and technology moving forward and support the people that are running this ecosystem? And I can give you more examples if you want, but those are some of the ideas of how do we make sure innovation is happening in the built environment and the people that are doing that are resourced with everything they need to be successful. Is this like everything from entry access system type stuff to HVAC and all that? Or are there specific areas that it really doesn't touch? All the above. If it's in the building you're sitting in, we're interested in it. So materials, concrete and steel alternatives, for sure, that could take 30 years and a venture capitalist can't wait around for steel to be a fifth of the cost it is. We can do that and we can fund and support steel research and alternative carbons and eco-materials a lot. So that's the big. Got it. It's really interesting. You know, one of my favorite things about doing this podcast is meeting people from all over the place who are doing such different things that I've never heard of <laughs> and didn't know were, were being done out there or didn't really never thought about. And this is certainly one. What are some of the big lessons, I guess, that you learned or are learning about the nonprofit space and how to approach success there? Lessons is a funny word because there are things I suspected that have turned out to be true. There is a lot of reporting, accounting, auditing things with the IRS that are cumbersome that I suspected. I didn't know about 
fundraising thresholds to maintain your 501c3 status. I've had to learn that, which is fine. It's not good or bad. I think also there are fuzzy lines between philanthropy and strategic investments. Meaning, is this something that we give to to feel better and for good PR and marketing for our marketing team? Or is this something that legitimately drives our business forward? Those buckets can be very distinct. And how do we tap into both of them is nuanced. And that's been interesting learning so far. And I would imagine also for the people, because it's a different type of investment, right? You're not investing to get your money back necessarily. You're investing to see what you can do and what these contributions can do to change the space. Well, let's make it real. Let's say you're the GSA in the United States and you're the biggest landlord on this planet. And I come to you and I say, I found a way where we can make concrete 20% cheaper with a lower carbon footprint. Do you think the GSA would be interested? For sure they would. Are they giving it to us because it checks a philanthropic box? Probably not. That's a money box. That's an ROI box. So that you see what I'm saying? Like, it's very difficult to have a playbook on that where at the end of the day, we're not blind to the fact that owners and managers want to make more money and we want them to. Like, that's a win for all of us. Find things that make you money. Are you giving us money because it feels good toward tithing and philanthropy or are you giving it to us because it'll make you more money? I don't carry the way as long as you give us the money to go do. But my point is like, I want to have empathy for that internal executive decision of where does this capital come from? And this fuzzy lines may mean slow decisions. I want very defined boxes that we're asking from and then makes an easier decision for you. That's really good. I would imagine also playing into that is the tax donation, the tax break that they get for that. A lot of these bigger organizations, they have money that they need to do that with every year. Does that play into it? That probably mattered more from 2012 to 2022 when people were swimming in free cash flow. That's not as much the case in 2024. You don't have a swamp load of profits you need to write off against. It'll come back, right? And we'll be in a better position where people will be begging for write-offs. But right now, excess revenue isn't a top three problem for most companies. Yeah, I definitely could see that. That probably speaks to nonprofits in general because there's so many nonprofits that rely on grants and donations from companies right now. How do you sort of pivot with that? And in those times when that's not as available now, I mean, you've started this more recently, yes. So maybe kind of didn't have that time, but (laughs) how do you see that? Ask me in five years is we haven't built our fundraising strategy yet around grants from the government or from the larger foundations than ours. It's more been, how do we get donors from our industry that understand what we're doing, where I don't have to explain what PropTech is or why mental health matters or why innovations and materials could change the planet. Like they already know that, right? It's how are we doing and how much are we asking for? So we've started with sort of the lower hanging fruit, so to speak, versus going to Rockefeller Foundation and talking on how much real estate they own and how we could help them. We haven't really approached them yet because those are not the people we touch most frequently. It's interesting because so much of what I do and through Rogue Creatives, our creative agency, is storytelling for nonprofits. And for this, it's still finding ways to bring people into that story, but the way to do it is very different. It's about the expertise, it's about the numbers, it's about the facts, the stats. There's always some of that in there, whereas a lot of nonprofits, there's also the kind of tugging on the heartstrings or showing the change in the life of an individual person. How has that come across? Like, how are you delivering that message? Is is it much more business kind of feeling than personal? No, I would say more often it's personal because most people have been through the problems we are describing. And so it's a give and take. It's like, hey, I've seen a few things that we think need to be fixed that we can fix. Would you be willing to donate to help with that? Also, what do you wish someone would fix that is not being fixed? So sort of as I build my product roadmap for our foundation, we always need to be listening to our donors and customers and saying, man, I wish those VCs would get off their butt and do X. And like, maybe we should do it. And so it's a listening because then we get to a place where it's like, well, I built the thing you asked me to build. Here's my donation link, right? Like this is what you said you wanted and we built it now. So it's a way of sort of, I don't want to say holding people accountable, but listening and saying, okay, I agree. We went and spent time and effort to build it. Here's our early results. We'd love for you to be considered donating to us on a regular basis. And when you build the thing, whatever that might be, if it's looking into, like you said, different approaches to steel or concrete or whatever it might be, or technological solutions, is that something that you guys actually put out and distribute or sell? Or is it something that you sell that tech or information to other companies for them to create with? So with mental health, we've said, hey, we've got a playbook, we've got partners, we've seen people using it. 
here's how much it costs us per month. Now let's go out and raise from someone that cares about founder mental health. And we have some ideas. Be. This is the dollars it will take for you to support that for the year of 2024. Would you be interested in that? So is that, a, I'm not really selling anything. I'm saying we built this, you can help us run it and I can spend our time and effort on new initiatives or with academia. You know, something that startups and real estate companies never have too much of talent, right? And if we're tapped to the brightest engineering minds on the planet, because they think prop tech and real estate is a big industry worth innovating in, you probably want to be involved in that, right? Maybe you donate to us and we give you access to some of the resumes and people in recruiting events, right? You say selling a thing. I don't have t-shirts that we sell. I don't have like a thing that we sell. Another thing that we do is we do booths at a bunch of trade shows where as much as I enjoy flat screens with software demos on them, things are still built. You are sitting on probably a concrete pad. They're still built by physical things. We need robots and drones and 3D printed walls and living walls. We need a show and tell center that I call our petting zoo where you can go touch things. So we sponsor a booth like that. Who cares about physical innovation in the built environment? I don't know, but I'm not really selling a booth. I'm saying we've built the booth. Will you help us sponsor that across industry events? So we aren't Tom's shoes where we sell a shoe and then clothe a kid. Like, we aren't that, but we are trying to have a direct linear path where you can see the impact of where your dollars go. And then as earlier, we're trying to always have impact on, hey, that event led to 60 new pilots being done in the built environment on the physical stage. That's unequivocally good for our industry. Who cares about that and would be willing to sponsor that? With prop tech and all the things you're working on, how does a lot of the tech innovations that are coming up, AI, virtual reality, all that, have you started playing in any of those areas yet? Sure. Just like blockchain a couple of years ago, we aren't looking for tech. If it's like the old saying about, People don't want to buy a drill. They want to buy a hole that was drilled. Like we frame it in terms of what's the problem you're solving. So yeah, yeah, it's neat. And we've looked at some AI neat things and what they can do, but it's more about what's the right problem for it to solve. Just like blockchain. We got all this blockchain. What problem is it solving? And it turns out tokenized real estate wasn't as urgent a problem as some people may have thought it was. And so tokenized real estate hasn't really taken off yet. Will in the future? I don't know. But tech, we are a problem and people first mindset, not a technology first mindset. Right. Tech or whatever it is, right? Those are the tools that you have at your disposal to try and solve some of those problems. But it's been interesting to see both in the nonprofit space and in the for-profit space as people either embrace some of these big new advances or run away scared from them or ignore them because they don't understand them. And that's just always an interesting conversation for me because everybody sort of has a different approach there. And I think a lot of people miss out on opportunities because they don't know how to dive in on those things or they're scared to dive in on those things or whatever it might be. Well, and that's just the adoption curve of any technology, kind of made famous by Jeffrey Moore in Crossing the Chasm, where you have the innovators, the early adopters, the late adopters, or the late majority and the laggards. Like there's a bell curve on how people adopt. But so I've sort of worked on not begrudging people because they're in the late majority because they don't care about it. Well, great. I can't help you. Like, Good luck. Have fun. We can be friends. Don't call me for help because I'm not your guy. People who are like, I will not let that guy down the street out compete me because he found a tech that I couldn't find. I can help that guy. That's a guy that wants my help. Yeah. And so much of, I think, business and nonprofit work and any work is really about is that it's finding the right fit, whether you're looking for donors, you're looking for investors, you're looking for whatever it might be. And the people who are in some way like minded and want to go where you want to go. And when they don't, that's great, but that's not the right fit for you. Exactly. And that's okay. <laughs> that's like dating, right? Just because we dated doesn't mean we have to get married. That's fine. Exactly. What inspired you to make that jump into nonprofit from for profit? I, I mean, was it just an opportunity that you were excited about, a new way to look at it, or did it just not make that much of a difference? It was an interesting opportunity, something that had already been sort of funded, something that was still in my space. But I kind of needed a break. I'd been raising funds for VC for half a decade, and I have young kids that still want me around and want to hang out. And so going and beating my head against the wall, flying to New York every 30 days in San Francisco and kissing rings and telling people how great they are so they invest in my fund was not something I wanted to do for a little while. Maybe I'll come back, but right now I'm glad to be a dad and have a little better pace. There's a little better pace in this world than there is in the venture world, which I, which I appreciate. And again, with my angel group, I can do deals anyways. So I didn't need a fund to do deals in prop tech either way. So it was nice to have a break, a nice opportunity, kind of a confluence of several things, I think. 
Yeah. How important has that been for you as far as like the work-life balance? Because burnout, both in the financial space and in the nonprofit world, is a big issue. And people ignoring their families or all that kind of stuff, not saying that's you, but it's a lot of work. How have you found that balance? I don't know that I have found because I've worked on it. And I'm always surprised to your point where people don't sort of realize the game that they're playing until it's too late. It's like, you think you're playing a game of career. You're actually playing the game of life where there are other people around you, right? And so of the 10 most wealthy people in the world, there's like 19 divorces. And it's like, what price are you willing to pay for where you're trying to go? And I'm not willing to pay the price as my wife and my kids, right? And so I don't know if I found the balance, but I always keep that as sort of my North Star is I'm not playing the game of who can have the biggest foundation or the highest net worth or who can be the most famous person in prop tech. I don't care. It's more, can I be a great dad and a great husband or even a good husband and still do a good job? Like the priority to me is that order is what's left over after my kids and wife have gotten what they need is what my job gets. I love that. That's great. I think a lot of people struggle with that. And it's just good to have that reminder of, Even if you're doing something altruistic, you're doing something you're passionate about, having that balance. And I don't think you ever really find it because life is always changing, right? Like the world is always changing. Your family's growing, whatever it might be. So it's not about finding the balance. It's about constantly weighing things out and figuring out where you need to be and how you can be the most healthy in that moment. Isn't that one of the Bezosisms about like be stickler on the goal and flexible on the path? Like this is the goal. And you need to be agile on how you get there. Yeah, I always tell people it's like you hang on to your why. You know what that is. But you got to hold all the other ones. The what, the where, the who, the when. That's all details. And those change and you got to hold them somewhat loosely because that stuff's not going to be the same. And you got to be able to flex with it and make the changes. Yep, agreed. A few last questions. What is the thing that makes you feel most connected in life? Being outside. I'm an outdoors person. I love being outside. Nice. How do you stay connected to your community? I assume you're not talking about my family. No. And I just moved to Phoenix this past year. Well, I would not say I'm super connected to Phoenix. Up with my real estate tech community, who I love and are my favorite. I do calls. I do text messages. We go to conferences together. I shoot people when we have dinners when I go to different cities. So nothing special. I mean, I genuinely like them. and It's not a lot of effort to go have dinner with my friends. Well, that's good. Is there somebody in the world of nonprofits that you look up to that you'd like to take to lunch? I love that the Gates Foundation is so thesis-driven. They're not reactive, they're proactive. But there was one that Bloomberg's family office did where they did like lives saved per dollar and they changed traffic lights in Thailand or something like that. Like it was nothing sexy or technology or fixing a disease. It was just like, if we got a bunch of traffic lights in Thailand, we'd save 100,000 lives or something. Like that is back to our North Star. That is knowing your North Star and not being obsessed with what's flashy or sexy. I love that. That I thought that was a great idea. That's very cool. And finally, what aspect of your job brings you the most joy? Feeling like I'm helpful to people that are in the industry is knowing that we are solving problems they've asked us to solve is a lot of fun. And that's a fun thing to wake up and do every day. Nice. Well, thanks so much for doing this, Matt. Where can people connect with you or your organization? I am always on LinkedIn. I answer all my emails, my notes on LinkedIn. So you're always happy to get me on LinkedIn. Or you can get me on my email. It's mnight with a K at innovate re like innovate real estate.org our website my email just i'm reachable if you need me nice well thanks so much for doing this it's so fascinating to get an insight into an area that i really know nothing about i love learning new things and learning about new areas and new approaches in and for nonprofit i think that's the beauty of a lot of what nonprofit can be is applied to a lot of different areas and there's so many people out there doing amazing things so i'm glad to hear that you're out there and you're doing this and making the world a better place. I'm trying. We'll find out. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, man. And my friends, that is a wrap for today. If you made it this far, and I don't know why you wouldn't, it's pretty awesome. Thank you so much for listening to Nonprofit Connect. We cannot tell you how much we appreciate it because we really appreciate it a lot. And it's hard to say that really well. We really would like it, though, if you came back for our next episode. Only if you liked it, obviously. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you use and visit our website, npconnect.roguecreatives.com. Hopefully we've managed to share insights to make you feel connected and even a smidge better about your life and the world and everything. Are our goals too high? Maybe. But that's how we like things. All right. You have yourself a great day. Bye-bye. 
Nonprofit Connect with Matt Barnes is hosted and executive produced by me, Matt Barnes, with an assist by my chaos coordinator, Tiffany Pope. Production is by our amazing friends over at Fame, the B2B podcast agency, along with Belinda Carter Thompson and the team here at Rogue Creatives. Production lead is Luke Audi at Fame. Writing is by Sam Hollis at Fame and Matt Barnes and Taylor Bolanos from Rogue Creatives. Nemanja Koljaja of Fame is our audio editor, and Arslan Yakub from Fame is our video editor. Creative direction is by Corey Hill of Rogue. Our artwork is designed by Hope Kelly and Joshua Marino at Rogue and Ian Salas of Fame. Theme music is composed and performed by Jared Atherton of Chapters. Luke Audi of Fame does our booking and our guest relations. Huge thanks to our amazing guests for joining us for this episode and to all of you incredible listeners for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, and I don't know why you wouldn't have, don't forget to help us spread some good by giving us a good review. Preferably, you know, five stars with lots of words saying how amazing we are on whatever platform you're listening on. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever it is. Also, tell your friends and subscribe so we can come straight into your potholes each and every time we have a new episode. For more information about Nonprofit Connect or to join us at a live event here in Orange County, California, visit our website, npconnect.roguecreatives.com. We'll catch you next time. This has been a Rogue Creatives production.